So the topic of uh, to, uh, today's webinar is EU policies for the clean energy in transition, gender gaps and inequalities. Uh, my name is, as I said, Ioana Mertoha Georgiou, my research assistant and PhD student at Aristotle's University of Thessaloniki. I'm focusing on household energy consumption, energy efficiency, demand response, and energy communities. And I'm very happy to have with me uh, my professor, assistant professor at Aristotle University of Thessaloniki, Yorgos Andreou, uh, whose uh, work is mainly on electrical power distribution networks and demand side management. And Paula Carroll, Associate Professor at University College of Dublin, who's, who's working on operations research and business analytics, uh, mainly on the clean energy transition. Today's uh, agenda, very briefly, you've probably already uh, seen it um, in the description of the webinar. Uh, firstly, uh, Jorgos is going to say a few things on why the clean energy transition is so crucial and how um, we have decided to achieve it, which are the main uh, uh, ways and tools we have towards uh, this direction. Uh, then I'm going to briefly present some basic EU policies that support uh, this transition and how we are trying to monitor the progress uh, we are uh, having. And uh, then Paula is going to discuss on uh, uh, is going to discuss about gender equality in the clean energy transition, where the main gaps and inequalities can be found. And uh, finally, we, we are going to discuss what's the missing data um, that, that we would like to have in order to assess uh, the level of uh, gender equality inside the clean energy transition. Uh, okay, so I'm I uh, will stop sharing my screen right now and I will reshare it later. And I'm inviting uh, Jorgos to share his screen. Okay, so let me just share my screen. Okay, so uh, Joanna, I'm guessing you are right now seeing my presentation, right? Yes. Okay, great. So, Thank you very much, Ioana, uh, for this opportunity to be here, actually. Uh, so as Ioana said, we are going to start in this part of the presentation by discussing um, some of the reasons why the clean energy transition is uh, such a crucial procedure and uh, some steps that we can um, uh, follow to achieve uh, the CET. So just to give a quick uh, definition, when we are talking about the clean energy transition, we are basically referring to a global shift from reliance on fossil fuels and uh, traditional energy sources to the adoption of renewable and low carbon energy technologies and practices. What we really mean by that is that we basically need a fundamental transformation of the energy sector to reduce greenhouse gas emissions, mitigate global warming, and, pro and promote sustainable development. So unfortunately, right now there is this huge uh, uh, discussion worldwide uh, whether we really need uh, the clean energy transition and what comes with it. And as also in other matters, what we need to do in this respect is follow the global uh, scientific consensus on that matter and in order to explain this a little bit better, we are going to use this graph. Now, what this graph is showing is the um, a global average temperature increase uh, as compared to pre-industrial times. That's the era between 1850s and 900s, let's say. And uh, this begins for us at uh, 2000 here, and we can see uh, what has happened until today in terms of uh, at the global average temperature increase. And there are also some projected scenarios for the future, right? So now we are at uh, 2023 at about 1.5 degrees of uh, temperature increase as compared to pre-industrial times. And what's important in, in this graph is to observe that if we continue on the path we are today, so with the policies that are already in place, then this means that we are probably looking 
at a uh, temperature increase of that we go beyond 2.5 degrees by year 2100. Um, but even with whatever we have promised today with the pledges that have been made but have not uh, yet been turned into policies, uh, that's the announced, the announced pledges scenario. Even in this case, uh, we would still be looking at a temperature increase of more than two degrees by the year 2100. And in fact, the only projection that seems to give some hope is the uh, green one, the net zero scenario, um, which um, brings us a, a temperature rises lower than 1.5 degrees after the year 2000. 60. But this is a scenario that states that uh, um, until year 2050, we will have reached net zero CO2 emissions in all our procedures. So at the same time, this is a highly unlikely scenario. Uh, now, the next question here would be, what do this numbers even mean. And in order to understand that, we have to look at the situation today. So today, it's about 1.5 degrees above uh, pre-industrial times. We have an increased intensity of extreme weather events. We observe increased, um, uh, increased the sea level rise, ocean acidification, biodiversity loss, and a decrease in food security. So there are there are scientists that believe that the, with all this happening at the 1.5 degrees uh, increase of temperature, at 2.5 degrees, we could be facing a catastrophic scenario for our species. So yes, if you ask me, we really need the clean energy transition. So the next question is, okay, so how do we achieve that? And our basic goal is to phase out fossil fuels, right? But in terms of that, even today, we tend to focus our attention or on the part of energy generation in terms of both renewable energy sources and energy storage. So there are trillions of euros of research and development on uh, renewable energy sources. We have seen a, a great development in um, wind, uh, solar, in, uh, in uh, uh, water solutions. And at the same time, we have energy storage solutions, mainly batteries, but also other ways. And all this is good, it's very good. We, we definitely need all of that. We need even more of it, but it's not enough. It's what we focus on. And we tend to focus on that because these are the solutions that bring profit. So they are more in line with this uh, dominant narrative of uh, um, of growth, of constant growth, constant economic growth. Uh, so this goes well until today. We need even more, of course, but uh, it seems to function. But it's not enough. We also have to follow other pathways here. And of course, we don't all only have to look uh, at the generation side, but we also have to consider the consumption. We need to limit our energy consumption. And there are a lot of ways that we can use in order to achieve that. For example, we have energy efficiency. We need to uh, have best, better insulation in our buildings, park better lighting systems, better appliances, vehicles, and of course, manufacturing processes. But then we also need to consider, to, to consider the actual habit of consuming, right? So we are talking in this respect about demand side management, about how we could um, regulate and limit the demand of energy in our systems. And in this respect, we have, we have some very good tools. For example, we have demand response, which is a, a procedure that can result in changes in the electric usage by end, by end use customers in response to incentives. But this is one of our problems today, 
if you see all the formal definitions of the term demand response, they are all limited to market-induced incentives. So we have this brilliant tool, a tool that it can help us a lot with limiting our overall consumption and achieving the clean energy transition. But again, we are only taking it uh, into account through the market, through profit, through uh, such notions. And this, in, in this case, this will basically not be enough. So the same goes also for other solutions like the optimization of our operation. I mean, we have the generation, we have the consumption, but we have a grid that has to support all this. So we need to modernize our power grid and we need to upgrade our infrastructure. But again, these are parts of a power system that do not produce profit. They are in a bit incompatible with this um, scenario of constant growth. So we tend to leave them behind. And that's a great problem because without modern grids, without upgrades in the infrastructure, we will not be able to uh, increase the penetration of renewables. We will not be able to support demand side management. And then of course, we also have sustainability, which we tend to forget a bit. And when we are talking about sustainability, we are basically talking about sustainability in all our, in all our um, uh, areas of uh, handling things. So we need to be sustainable. We, we need to reduce deforestation, to improve our agricultural practice. Basically, it's not just the reduction of deforestation. We need to stop thinking of the earth as only a means to produce as profit. So right now it's um, something that we tend to think it's at, at our disposal and we can use it for whatever reason we need to make more profit. We need to stop that. We need to not change the land uses and to uh, we need to have a degrowth. We need to step back a bit. And of course we need to establish a circular economy. Now, the thing is, that with all these measures that I'm talking about are not really an a la carte menu to choose from. So it's not like we have all these solutions and we will make it with one or two of them. It's not like we can choose, we can select some of them and be okay. We need to be effective and successful in all of them. And that's a problem. So if we want to combine all these together and just keep one point of this part of the uh, presentation, this would be that if we want to really achieve the clean energy transition, what we really need to do is to abandon the dominant narrative of constant growth. We need to stop thinking about um, growth in terms of economy. Uh, we, we need to stop thinking of results in terms of economy. We need to start thinking of results in terms of our um, of uh, continuing to be here, let's say. So with uh, with all this, just a small part on uh, um, clean energy transition. I would uh, like to give the floor back to Ioana so that she takes it from here. Thank you. Hello and thank you, Jorgos. Uh, give me one minute. Sorry. Yes, I found my mouse. Okay. <laughs> Okay, uh, so uh, just to um, uh, explain a bit how uh, the things that uh, Yorgos was describing are adopted on an EU and an international and a UN level, European Union and uh, United Nations level. Here we collected the main um, policies, agreements, directives that were adopted during the last eight years. Um, Below you can see the UN uh, agreements uh, 
and uh, above uh, with green, it's the European uh, Union policies. So starting from 2015, there was uh, the global decision of the Sustainable Development Goals, the SDGs. You probably have heard them before. There are 17. The, most, uh, the ones that most relate to our project are number, number five, gender equality, and number seven, affordable and clean energy. They are setting a, a list of goals and priorities for all the members that uh, adopted them. Then in November 2015, the uh, report uh, um, for the Energy Union was adopted. The goal uh, agreed on the European level to create a more secure, sustainable, competitive and affordable energy system for Europe. And then later in 2019, the Clean Energy for All Europeans package uh, was uh, adopted to address all five dimensions of the Energy Union uh, described there. Uh, in between the Paris Agreement, it's one of the most famous agreements of the last years, um, there was a, a, a global agreement that we need to keep global warming below two degrees Celsius and try uh, to, to make it even 1.5, as Joros was also describing in uh, his uh, slides. Another very important European um, uh, deal is the European Green Deal which sets three main goals and um, a lot of other uh, directives and uh, decisions. Zero percent emissions until 2050, economic growth decoupled from resource use, and the one which is uh, um, the social aspect of the clean energy transition that we are also discussing here, no person and no place left behind. So we can see that the inclusion uh, is, is becoming a more uh, dominant aspect, uh, even in a policy level. Uh, the Fit for 55 uh, set the goal for 2030 to 50%, and the Repower EU plan adopted after the war in Ukraine um, identified the need to accelerate even more this transition, uh, increased the percentage of renewable energy sources expected to be installed uh, and working until 2030. So it's 45% until 2030 now on, uh, in EU, uh, as well as improve energy efficiency, investor efficiency and development. In between the uh, Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, which is uh, this uh, um, um, uh, chapter of the UN with a lot of scientists that they work on reporting on climate uh, change, uh, said that 1.5 should be the goal for what we are doing uh, right now. And we should accelerate renewable energy sources installation, and we should protect and restore forests and uh, more. Um, OK. The way we are trying to assess this uh, transition is by uh, adopting a series of indicators, different and different policies and different uh, um, uh, actions. But the, for example, the most important one is measuring the emissions. The European Environment Agency does it on a European level. Uh, then we have Eurostat, another important uh, data set on a European level. We, uh, we can see the level of um, the um, rate of renewable energy sources adoption. Uh, sorry, not, this is not the rate, it's the percentage, but there is also, um, there are uh, and other indicators uh, showing also the rate, the change between uh, the years, the way we are, the, the rate we are progressing with. And this is a, another social um, indicator Population unable to keep home adequately warm by poverty status. This is an indicator measured under sustainable development goal number seven, affordable and clean energy. I'm ju I just included um, some indicative, um, uh, 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 some indicative uh, indicators here, indicative indicators, uh, just to show that we are trying to, we are trying to document this uh, clean energy transition on different uh, levels and um, however there was a, there is a lack of um, the gender dimension inside these policy papers this, this is uh, 
also something that uh, Paula will talk about in detail. Uh, I just want to uh, address that uh, most of the uh, most of the policies and directives that we discussed about do not uh, include any reference to gender or sex. There is just um, uh, the um, Euro the European Parliament resolution of uh, January 2020 of the European Green Green Deal that re references gender, and 10 out of the 27 national energy and climate plans adopted by each country on an EU level that mention gender or um, include it as an indicator or as a goal or um, yeah as as part of their plans. Um, the only data that we have on an EU level uh, showing uh, gender equality inside uh, the clean energy transition is just an indicator of the European Union Labour Force survey showing the percentage of women working in electricity, gas, steam and air conditioning supply. And then we have se several other data sets, for example, for the European Institute of Gender Equality, the C figures report. The International Energy Agency, International Renewable Energy Agency, which publish reports and um, document the gender dimension uh, inside the clean energy transition. But most of the um, data is uh, qualitative uh, and uh, outdated. So part, part of our discussion here is also to identify what to measure, like which areas um, face the most, um, the most problems in terms of gender gaps and inequalities and how to monitor and address them. So I will invite uh, Paula um, to talk to us about uh, these areas of gender gaps and inequalities. Thank you. So I just wanted to set the context a little bit because when people talk about the clean energy transition, um, People are very motivated, quite emotional about us. Some people really believe we need urgent action and other people are kind of quite lackadaisical about it and think maybe we don't really have a problem yet. Um, and in the main, I think one thing that I find interesting is that people don't really see a connection at all to gender equality. So as Iona mentioned, we have these uh, UN Sustainable Development Goals, but they're not all necessarily well connected so there is the risk that you know we go in one direction trying to get clean energy but we miss out then on the the direction of gender equality so i just wanted to show you this uh, just really to highlight about you know is there a problem in terms of gender equality and this is something that happened in 2019 uh, some of you may have seen this there was a, a big headline splashed across all the the newspapers that nasa had scrapped its first all-female spacewalk um, and there was a lot of talk on, on social media um, and it transpired that the reason they, they cancelled it wasn't because they were bad female women drivers, is that they didn't actually have uh, enough correctly sized spacesuits for the women to go out and actually uh, do the walk. Um, and it just really highlights that if a, a big organisation like NASA, who are renowned for their operational planning, if they can get it wrong, we can also all get it wrong, that we're just really not alert to thinking about these things. So the tools they were providing to do the job weren't quite right. So the women couldn't do their job because they hadn't got the right tools. So just to mention, spacesuits, I have no intention of ever being an astronaut because I get motion sick just going in the car. Uh, but spacesuits are available in sizes uh, medium, large and extra large. And most women wouldn't fit into any of those. The issue here was that they didn't have two configured medium sized spacesuits to allow the women uh, to do the women, uh, female astronauts, do their job. So really it's just to highlight that there are kind of, you know, it's it's general, it's out there. There's a gender dimension to a lot of what's going on in the world that we're just really maybe not alert to. Um, so I wanted to talk a little bit about the, the gender dimension of the energy transition and how we might start connecting the policies, because as Georges and Iona highlighted to us, um, it's through planning and policies that we then get legislation and action. That's how things happen. Um, so the EU gender equality strategy says, in, in relation to the, the different um, EU plans, uh, that we're going to have um, 
specific needs and challenges and opportunities in things like transport and energy. And the EU overall plan is to do what they call gender mainstreaming. And gender mainstreaming is the idea of inserting gender uh, as um, a, a component of all the other plans and actions. So it's all EU plans and actions, not just the, the clean energy transition. Um, but this strategy is coming from the EU gender equality strategy. So it, it's their ambition that gender will be mainstreamed into all uh, policies. Uh, but what IOTA pointed out is that it's not been reciprocated. So in the other departments that are making the other plans, we haven't quite made the connections yet. But one success that we are having is in terms of EU funding for research. So you may have heard of the Horizon Europe um, funding mechanism. So they're the EU flagship for research. Um, and what has happened is that all of the uh, proposals and calls for the Horizon Europe um, funding projects, they now have a requirement that any of the higher education institutions that want to apply have to have a thing called a gender equality plan that has to be publicly available on the university or higher education institutions uh, website. And that's an eligibility cri criterion. So if you don't have that, uh, you can't actually apply for the funding. Uh, they've also um, included in the Horizon Europe that there has to be a gender dimension in the research itself. And this is hugely challenging. So George comes from a power systems background um, and people might say, where is the gender dimension of power systems? And it's not immediately obvious. But once you start looking, we can find the connections. So inserting the gender dimension into the research content is a default on all Horizon Europe um, calls, uh, unless there's a special exemption. Um, and that will be a, an award criterion. And then in terms of the uh, project team, um, the gender balance is taken into account if um, the other um, scorings give a, a tie between two, two different proposals. So two different proposals have uh, an equal score. They look at the gender balance of the uh, consortium and that can be used to decide who gets the funding. So we are having success and um, we're getting gender uh, mainstreamed in through the research by making it a component of the, the research uh, funding. So that's a little bit about what the EU gender equality goals are. So at a broader level, not just at, at um, uh, research, it's, it's about you know, creating visibility and opportunity uh, for women. Uh, and one thing I wanted to look at is if we step outside just, just research, uh, how are we doing in the EU, EU in terms of, and I only mentioned, how do we measure these things? So where are the metrics? How, how do we know we're doing well or doing badly or so on? And one thing is the, a simple gender pay gap measurement. So this comes from a, a 2021 uh, report at the EU level. You can see down here, um, the overall EU average is about 12.5%. I see Greece and Ireland, where I come from, are over here um, at, at about average. Um, and you might say, well, gender pay gap, that's all well and good. We understand there are reasons why on average, women get paid less than men. They may work part-time, they may take time out of their career, so they don't make so much career progress. They may work in jobs that are less well paid. They may work at a level in the organization that um, isn't a, a management position. So there are lots of reasons for this gender pay gap, but on average, we should really be saying, why? Why are st women still being paid on average less than men? And the thing I want to point out here is that we still have this um, perspective of everything is with respect to the male norm. So even the EU gender pay gap is with respect to the male uh, gross earnings. So that's just gender pay gap in general uh, across the EU. Um, I wanted to talk a little bit about how this connects with what we're doing on the clean energy uh, transition. Uh, and we talk about the energy trilemma. So the energy trilemma is that we want this future clean energy system to be secure. So it has to be reliable, even after we make all these changes. It has to be equitable. So there has to be an opportunity for all people to have energy to serve their needs. Uh, and it has to be sustainable. So it's not at the moment. So there's certainly opportunities for, for change. Um, again, just in terms of metrics and measures, how do we measure how we're doing on all of these? Um, there's an energy trilemma index. And I just wanted to highlight to you that number one in the world is Sweden, who is an EU member. And I wanted to 
just mark on your radar. So there's Sweden over there. They have an average gender pay gap. In general, they do well on gender equality indices, but on a gender pay gap, um, they're about average. So that is our uh, energy trilemma uh, index. Um, and I just want to kind of put those things on your radar and think about them. We're going to talk about four uh, different strands very quickly in a second. Um, I'm from Ireland, so I'm very familiar with the context in Ireland. And I invite you to have a look at your national statistics as well and see how are uh, you doing. Just again, back to policies and um, they, they get in translated into directives and legislation. The EU now requires that all organisations that employ more than 200 people produce their gender pay gap reports. So you can look and see uh, how your institutions um, are actually doing. So other policies and things that happen. So again, just taking Ireland as a second as a little case study. Uh, Ireland has one of those national climate and um, energy action plans, and it was updated in 2023. And here are the highlights here. We'll talk about those for a second. So they connect with what Georges was saying. So more renewable energy, uh, better homes, so more efficient, so insulating them, um, changing how we travel, so transforming travel. And what I want to kind of highlight for two seconds here is George has also talked about agriculture. So changing how we farm, how we produce our food and so on. Changing maybe what crops and um, things that we make available, they may connect with biofuels for transport. So there's a lot going on in transition, in flux. And a lot of these things are responding to policies. So the history of Ireland is we don't have a huge industrial heritage. We have an agricultural heritage. So we have a lot of our greenhouse gases coming from uh, agriculture. So we need to change how we farm. Basically, a lot of things uh, need to change. So that's our clean energy plan. Just want to draw your attention to this. So the EU does not require uh, member states to produce gender equality plans. Uh, Ireland did create one in 2016, which was adopted in 2017, but it lapsed in 2020 and it was never actually finalised. It was never fully implemented. We haven't measured uh, how we have progressed against that plan. So it's again just to highlight if there's a directive that says you have to do it from the EU, you have to do it. If there's no directive, it doesn't necessarily have to happen. So there's no directive about a gender equality plan, um, and a national one, but there are directives about producing gender pay gap. Um, so how is Ireland actually doing in terms of gender equality? Um, the Central Statistics Office of Ireland does produce some statistics, and I just want to highlight um, this little graph down here on the right, which hopefully you can see. So we'll get back to decision making in a second and we'll, we'll talk about these things. But just this one here, bottom right, hopefully you can see that. So this is a statistic about who owns the farms. So over here in our uh, National Energy Climate Plan, we want to talk about making family farms more sustainable, changing our land, land use. And down here we can see that uh, men own um, over 88% uh, of the family farms. So the opportunity for women to engage in um, um, meaningful uh, activities uh, is limited because they literally don't own the farms. So again, that's the Irish case. You, you can have a look at, at your national um, case. So we're going to move into the uh, energy transition a little bit more. And I just want to bring to your attention what they call the four Ds of the energy transition. So these relate to what uh, George was talking about as well, this idea of decarbonizing. So we have to change from fossil fuels, and George can correct me, but when we um, transform fossil fuels in power plants to electricity, there's an efficiency loss of maybe something like 70%. And when we transport it then from the power plants to our homes, there's a further efficiency of somewhere between 8 and 15%. And that kind of moves us towards the logic of decentralization. So Put the renewable energy sources where they're going to be used and it'll be more um, efficient. Um, back to George's uh, demand response problem. So when we start doing all of this, uh, the power system has evolved over the last 100 years or so. Um, so changing it quickly is very, very hard. Um, and one of the tools we might be able to use to help us is digitalization. So using digital technology to help uh, balance supply and so, on, and so on. And one of the key um, components of the EU strategy um, is 
for the clean energy transition is democratization. So encouraging citizens to become involved, to take responsibility and play a, a part. Now that is a huge ask because as I said, the power system has evolved over more than a hundred years. The people who manage and own it are very large corporations that have a lot of power and authority and experience. So it is a huge challenge for ordinary citizens to step forward and respond to the call to uh, democratize the energy system. So I just invite you to, to rem remember those four Ds as we talk about uh, our next couple of ideas. So I will just try and watch the time here to see where we're at and um, talk very briefly about things like the labor market. So Iona has touched a little bit on some of these. I just want to bring some statistics to your, to your attention. So again, the EU uh, gender equality strategy. So there's some nice words here about the goal of the union is that we can all achieve in all our diversity, be free to pursue our chosen path, have opportunities to thrive and equally participate and lead our society. Uh, the practical things are that we have societies that have gendered norms that have a long history of operating in a particular way. So change is very difficult. Um, this is a slightly older uh, report, but again, the gender pay gap um, from this report was at about uh, 16%. Uh, a couple of things to flag um, is, again, on average, um, there are less women in full employment across the EU than men. And these things make a difference because this and dictates how much money you have, the type of home that you live in, and the opportunities that you have to purchase things like an electric car or a heat pump or a PV panel or, or so on, or whether or not you own your own home. And um, what we do see is that on average, women's pensions, because of their history of employment, um, are far lower. So what we see is that in the older age groups, we tend to have more lone female headed households and they may be in energy poverty. And this last one to flag here again, and they all connect, um, is that of the um, bulk of care work that has to be done, the bulk of that care work is performed by women. So that care work may be minding your own children or minding a relative or minding elderly parents. And it, it's work that has to be done, but doesn't get um, remunerated. And it does impact on people's time. So if you're engaged in this kind of unpaired care, aid care work, uh, you don't necessarily have the opportunity to participate in the democratization of the, the energy system. So again, it's just trying to connect all of these things. So as I said, and Iona has mentioned as well, this idea of gender mainstreaming, um, targeted actions, so transport and energy, uh, agriculture, the things where we know there are going to be difficulties and gender imbalances to specifically decide how we're going to measure um, and how we're going to act. So it's a really um, big uh, challenge. So still on the labour force, again, these tools, I want to mention some of them, she figures and uh, this arena um, report, uh, gender perspective, they just highlight to us what's actually happening at the moment. So in academia, so a lot of the research happens in uh, academia. So this uh, figure here, uh, about 42% of all uh, academic, uh, academic staff in the EU are, are female. Uh, but if we look at this slide over here, what we can see is they tend to be more at the lower um, positions, which means in turn they're paid less and they have less agency, they have less opportunity, and they tend to be more in precarious uh, work contract. So it might be a short term contract, which again has a compounding effect because they may not be eligible uh, to apply for funding schemes or, or other opportunities. And we can see up here as well um, that there are a lower proportion of women in the, the senior grades, the decision making uh, roles. We'll come back to that in a second. So that's academia. That's where the research tends to take place. Um, but if we just look at the energy sector and we're kind of overlapping a little bit, about 34% of the um, renewable energy workforce uh, is female. And if we think back to those four Ds, um, the nature of the work is changing. So if there's more digitalization, that doesn't require upper body strength. Um, it requires uh, skills and knowledge. Um, so you can sit at a, a desk and do this uh, kind of work. Um, you do obviously have to install the, the PV panels and so on. And an interesting um, 
a discussion I recently had with a colleague who works in offshore wind farms is that when they moved to make the harnesses uh, suitable for women to do the work, they found that it actually improved overall safety. So when they went and actually really looked at it, it was better for everybody. It wasn't just opening an opportunity for women, it improved the safety for all of the offshore uh, wind turbine workers. Okay, uh, in the traditional um, energy sector, about 22% of the workforce are female. And again, the same that we're seeing here in academia, um, when we go up to those higher levels, so those well-paid decision-making roles, uh, only 5% of executive board members of utility companies um, are female. Really what we want to highlight is that with the right tools, and um, there are opportunities there uh, for women to, to work in the clean energy um, transition. Okay, that is the workforce and it links with decision making. So depending on what kind of job you're working at, um, you have different agency, you have different control, different responsibilities. If you're at the lower levels, you don't have so much control or responsibility. But when you move up to those decision making roles, you have responsibility and opportunity um, to make decisions and make changes. So again, some of my figures here might be slightly misaligned if they've come from different reports because things are changing uh, all the time. Uh, but there is um, an, another uh, piece, again, from the European Institute of Gender Equality. They produce some interesting reports. Um, and another one that uh, says that uh, in large companies, only 30% of executive board positions are filled uh, by women. And you might wonder, like, why is it important then that we start talking about making sure that we get women represented in decision making? And this um, um, figure here, again, comes from the European um, Institute of Gender Equality, and it just shows the gender balance at national representative level. So, you know, governments in different countries have different um, mechanisms. Um, I come from Ireland, which is, where is Ireland gone? I can't find it now. And um, here we are over here. This is our national representation. And we saw that in the figure earlier. And you just see this orange line here that I want to talk a little bit about, which is called a quota. And it's one of the big debates about whether or not we should start introducing quotas to effect change. Um, and what happened in Ireland was that in um, 2019, uh, a law was enacted that said if the uh, parties um, that wanted to put forward candidates for in our general election for our National Assembly, if they didn't put forward at least 30% female candidates, their funding, their National Central funding would be withdrawn. So it was a carrot and a stick approach. So they could decide to go ahead, but they would have lost their funding. And um, so all of the main parties put forward at least 30% female candidates for the general election. And it had a positive effect, but you can see 23% uh, of the legislature in Ireland is uh, female, which is on the low side. Drawing your attention back to Sweden, who we mentioned earlier on. So Sweden are, are at nearly 50-50. So there are things that they're doing well in some of our EU member states that we can learn from. Um, okay, then why, why do we want to have women representing uh, women at this decision-making level. So one, it's symbolic. It's, you know, gives role models um, and visibility. Uh, but two, they tend to bring ideas to the table that their male counterparts might not have thought of. So they play a slightly different role sometimes, and they bring diverse opinions, um, not on, on um, uh, national par parliament level, but you may have heard of the work of Sheryl Sandberg, who wrote a book called Lean In. She promoted this philosophy of women should enforce their uh, belief and lean in at the table. She later retracted most of us, but um, in one nice example, she did talk about when she was pregnant, she pointed out that there was no car park positions near the building entry for pregnant women. Um, and, you know, people just literally hadn't thought about it because the people that were making the decisions were in the main men who had obviously never been uh, pregnant. But it's just that having those diverse perspectives just lets you bring new ideas uh, to the fore. OK, that's a little bit about kind of labour markets and so on. Um, moving on to women in local energy communities and in, in decision making capacities. We talked about the four Ds and we talked about democratisation. Um, so all of the clean energy packages talk about placing the citizen at the center of the energy transition. And that's a huge shift. Uh, it's a huge opportunity, but it's also a huge challenge. 
So some of the, the research has shown that, so these local energy communities are groups of people who come together and um, first they may just, you know, look at their energy needs, but they may also decide they want to actively participate in the market. So form an entity that participates uh, in the market. And, and the research has shown so far that um, quite often men respond to this call because they're really interested in the technical challenge. So that, that idea of really, um, doing something transformative with technology, whereas women may respond because they feel obliged that there's an environmental challenge and they should really respond uh, to that. Uh, I know we're nearly up on time, so our, our slides are here, which can be shared later. So I'm going to move on from the local energy communities just to say they are forming. They are something that's relatively new. In Ireland, they're completely new. In other jurisdictions, they have a history, um, but they relate to end use. So end use um, is really about the demand side. So George has talked about the supply side. Fossil fuels historically have been used to supply our, our energy needs. Um, what we found when we started looking about um, looking at uh, end use is that most of the research had focused on women in the global south. So rather than uh, women in, in the EU, uh, women in the global south. And we can learn from that work uh, quite a lot of that work focused on, you know, what were the efficient ways to provide energy so that they could um, make an impact on deforestation. So really, they, you know, there were um, competing objectives. One was deforestation, the other was women's health, for example, and there were initiatives about producing um, effective cooking stoves in the developing world. And most of those projects failed because they were looking at the wrong problem really they were really looking at deforestation rather than women's health and women's needs so it's really important to make sure that women's needs are included when we're redesigning uh, the system so what we found when we looked at our our, our um, research is the the following themes emerged and um, when um you looked at end use it was um energy citizen engagement we've talked a little bit about that men and women tend to play slightly different roles uh, attitudes and willingness to pay which touches back to george's point about economic incentives or financial incentives to change the way you use electricity um, some other um, papers were really focused on the social justice side and sustainability and they really are different strands of research um, and they're not really well connected so there is an opportunity to connect them a little bit better and this last one here about energy use patterns, which connects very nicely with what Georges was saying, how we use electricity. And I think we're nearly up on time, so I will just show you this. Um, this is a little piece of work that we're doing about what are called um, reference load profiles. So we said that the power system evolved over nearly 100 years. The network that transports the electricity and the, the piece that's near your home is called the low voltage network. And they make it of the size that it can carry the peak demand in Ireland in the winter, for example. So if we look at these little diagrams over here on the left hand side, we can see um, when the season is winter, uh, we get these kind of peaky demand in the evening time. So the different colored lines are showing weekday usage, weekend usage, um, and we started wondering do these usage profiles have a gender dimension? Or if women are using electricity, and this is just electricity here, um, are they using that slightly different than men? So what we would like in the future energy system is that the demand is not so peaky. So it may, means that the system is less redundant if we could flatten that demand a little bit. So could we use our, our solar PV maybe to charge batteries and then have the electricity available uh, when it's needed? So there are huge research challenges in understanding what is the impact on these reference load pro profiles when we adopt all of these new technologies. There are huge questions about who can buy these new technologies. So if you don't own, own your own home and um, if you don't have the money for these things, uh, you're not going to be able to participate in any of that. And that's possibly where local energy communities can play a role. So if it's at a community level, it's not up to the individual uh, to provide the money uh, to provide these things. I will, I'm nearly there because I know everyone is probably getting nervous about the timing. So just very briefly, this data set came from a trial that the Irish uh, regulator did um, on smart meters. Uh, so consumer behaviour trial on smart meters. We are, they have started rolling out smart meters in Ireland. But before they did that, they tried to figure out um, 
how do people behave when they have smart meters? Is it of a, a benefit to them and so on? And I've just taken a sample from that smart meter trial. Um, the trial came with the energy usage, but also a pre and a post survey. So we can get what we call labeled data. So I can go into the data and figure out um, which of the head of households were male, which of the head of households were female, and um, uh, what kind of heating they had, different things like that. So I picked out the single um, households, or the uh, households with the single individual, so rather than the family. So now I'm not muddying the waters with other people in the house. And these are homes that are a single male or a single female. And that's the number that were in the trial of those household types. And what I was wondering was, um, are their energy usage patterns different or the same? So their average usage is more or less the same. So it's not statistically uh, different, but their max usage, so their peak usage, statistically, it's a little bit different. And this is interesting because, again, we go back to those caring responsibilities of women, the stereotypes, how women actually behave. So it looks like women have, in this, this set of data anyway, a slightly peakier uh, energy usage than the male uh, counterparts. So that's an interesting opportunity. So, you know, if we can get that peak down a little bit, that could be helpful. But I've just listed a couple of things for us to start thinking about. So you, at the moment, the media is full of chat GPT and AI and all the things that are happening and it connects with the digitalization. But we need to think about what are the GDPR and ethical considerations of looking at these types of data sets to start targeting women, for example, to reduce their peak. Um, because in the main, if they if they are in energy poverty, for example, and don't have the opportunities to change, um, we're putting an extra responsibility uh, on them that they may try to respond to, but feel that they actually can't. Okay, that's a whole load of stuff uh, going on there. We're really out of time. I own how much, long have I got left? Have I got one minute? One minute, very, very quickly. I'll just show you these. And again, it connects with some of what we were talking about in terms of digitalization. So one of the big things that I see happening is the intersection now of the ICT and the energy sectors. And that's smart, smart grid developing. These again are some um, statistics from the EU. And um, again, you can read them for yourself. But if we ask, um, young um, boys and girls, where do they see themselves in the future? So one in four boys, they expect a career as an engineer or a scientist and, and fewer girls. And in contrast, one in three girls expect to have a career as a health professional. So there's kind of stereotyping stuff going on uh, in there. We would like to see balance. It's better for society to bring that diversity um, to both professions. So not just getting more women working in STEM, but more boys working in, in healthcare and education professions is better for everyone. And um, just this highlight over here, only 22% of AI programmers are women. And you'll have heard all of the um, uh, reports in the media about the gender biases um, that exist in the data. When AI systems are trained on that data, they amplify the bias. So they, you know, they don't tend to reduce it or ignore it. It's there, it's in the systems historically. Um, and if we're not careful, the AI systems will just uh, reinforce that. This is just a quick snapshot from Ireland of women in research. So quick highlights here is that women tend not to put their, their, their applications forward for research funding. Um, if they do, they tend to be successful. But in the main, down here, what we're seeing is when women do apply for research funding, they're not looking for so uh, much money as their male counterparts. So maybe they're not being ambitious enough. Maybe they're being more realistic. They're saying this is how much it will actually cost, whereas their male counterparts might be overemphasizing um, their, their case. So that is kind of just highlights of a few bits and pieces, which I hope um, have connected things. Last thing from me here is... Here's where I see some of the challenges to getting more women into STEM, so building that pipeline. So hysterical stereotypes, lack of uh, role models, lack of awareness of opportunities by the women, but lack of awareness of the obstacles by the males. So that was very apparent, apparent in that Irina uh, gender um, dimension uh, report, that women were alert to the difficulties in career progression in the energy uh, field, whereas the male counterparts, the males who tended to hold the senior positions, didn't feel that there were any issues. Um, and this is the big thing for me. So this is where I see um, there is an issue. There's a, a lack of champions. And here I've highlighted over here, what are the opportunities? So mentoring, 
and male champions. So, you know, people who know the roadmap, sharing that knowledge and insight. So again, there are kind of this from, again, the European Institute of Gender Equality. They have kind of tools um, that can help. And there are things like Iona is talking about, what are the metrics and measures we need to start measuring so that we can make visible any of these gender equality issues in the um, energy transition. So that is it from me. There's lots of opportunities, lots of uh, challenges, and it's a really interesting time to be involved in the area. So apologies if I went over time. I have no clock in front of me, so I'm going to stop sharing. Thank you, Iona. Thank you very much, Paula. Thank you uh, very much, Yorgos. There is uh, some space for questions. That, uh, you can write them in the chat or the Q&A. Uh, if you have any uh, questions regarding any of the presentations. Uh, from my side, I hope that it's um, more clear to all of you why it's important to, to make this transition. How are we measuring it? How are we assessing it? And what, why is gender equality, why does gender equality needs to be integrated uh, inside this uh, transition? Um, and for me, it, um, it's really important what uh, Paula said in the beginning that in, it might seem difficult to make the connection in the beginning, like how is uh, energy connected to uh, gender equality? Uh, I remember one of my friends uh, telling me, oh, you're working in this project with um, uh, women PV panels. And I'm like, no, there are no women PV panels. Uh, we, we are talking not only, uh, of course, about women, we're talking uh, about gender, uh, including all genders. And we're talking about equality in terms of access to knowledge, uh, decision making, as, as Paula was uh, uh, making the list, energy use, uh, uh, democratization. For example, in Greece, 40th, uh, uh, based on a um, Greenpeace report of 2020, 42% uh, 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 of the energy communities do not include any female member in the board of directors. Uh, so, for example, we need to see how, uh, by strengthening the energy communities, we are not deepening any more inequalities and injustices. And this is just a, um, um, two comments from me. Um, I don't know, Jorgos, if you have any other extra comments. Oh, I have to say I, I enjoyed uh, Paula's uh, uh, presentation very much because it's uh, exactly what we need to put in the clean energy transition in order for in order to change our perspective and uh, try to make whatever to do whatever is needed in order for us to achieve it's it's what's it's actually everything that was missing from my presentation so thank you very much for that uh, so uh, we are open to questions as Joanna said I hope everything was too clear. Yeah. Or too obscure, it always can go both ways, but okay. I think um, I think also um, there's a lot of information inside the MOOC. Um, I hope the participants are already familiar with some of the things we said and are going to get even more familiar um, as they follow through the MOOC during the following weeks. Uh, we were very happy to have you here. Thank you for your participation. Um, I think we could uh, uh, close the session now. Um, with the, the contacts will be available anyway, so in case you have any follow-up uh, questions or um, requests, we could uh, we could reply after the session too. Thank you very much, Ewan and Georges. I really enjoyed the, the session today. Thank, Thank you. you very much, Paula. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. Bye, everyone. Thank you very much.